This episode is brought to you by LMNT. Healthy hydration isn't just about drinking water, it's about water plus electrolytes. It makes sense, you lose both water and sodium when you sweat. Both need to be replaced to prevent muscle cramps, headaches and energy dips. But most people only replace the water. Why? Well, because since the 1940s we've been told to drink 8 glasses of water per day, thirsty or not. Drinking beyond thirst is a bad idea. It dilutes blood electrolyte levels, especially sodium, which leads to headaches, low energy, cramps, confusion, or even worse. This low sodium situation called hyponatremia is very common amongst endurance athletes, shift workers, and those who work outside in the heat, leading to thermal stress. The solution isn't to stop drinking water, it's to drink water plus electrolytes. This is where LMNT comes in. Just mix this flavor, electrolyte drink mix into your water bottle and you're good to go. It's got no sugar or artificial junk, just electrolytes. LMNT has your electrolyte needs covered. Former research biochemist Rob Wolf and Keto Gains founder Tyler Cartwright and Louis Villasener formulated LMNT to provide the optimal ratios of sodium, potassium and magnesium for health, performance and energy. They also formulated LMNT to please your palate. Many different flavors such as orange salt, citrus salt, watermelon salt and many many more. Just head over to LMNT to find out. Or better still, go down to the show notes, click on the link, the sleep for performance link, to get um, to click on this and get your free promotional pack where you can get a taster pack and no questions asked refund policy as well. You don't even need to send it back. So check it out at LMNT in the show notes. Welcome back to the Sleep for Performance podcast. This is part two of a special series that we are recording, looking at this paper by Jesse. And um, another guy as well who basically just jumped on the back of Jesse's coattails for this paper and uh, didn't really contribute, but, you know, speaks with a fake French accent. Uh, some people call him a doctor, but his name is actually Jonathan Shress. So Jonathan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for the nice introduction, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Jesse paid me fifty dollars to uh, give you that hateful introduction. <laughs> it's I can true, imagine. and more is coming with more defamation, and uh, you know, the more you can degrade Jonathan, the happier I will be. But, but truthfully, uh, it was a nice collaboration between the two of us, and. Um, I, I really appreciate his efforts across the board. And it kind of alludes to the conversation we were having earlier that if Jonathan hadn't put the effort he had put into this, he wouldn't be my co-author because <laughs> I'd be pissed about it. It'd be unethical and I'd kick him off the team. Okay. Let's, let's, let's have some nice speech from now on. Okay. Let's, let's create our speech. Let's not be hateful like people on Twitter and let's be nice. <laughs> you may not be more Canadian. <laughs> let's be more Canadian. <laughs> Polite. I'm not queuing Jonathan for an hour to do this. <laughs> I thought we were in the year 2023. Politeness is out the door. It's about how <laughs> bombastic you can be. And yeah, let's, 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 let's cause, let's throw some logs on the fire and really blow yeah. some things up here. Let's do this in the, in the, in the vein of a musical. We shall sing every conversation. Uh, you may notice say I'm wearing a beautiful t-shirt called sleep for performance. Uh, if anybody would like to uh, purchase the Sleep for Performance t-shirts, please email me, write the show notes down below, because we are looking at potentially supplying these. Many people have liked them. And as a special prize for our two podcast uh, guests today on this episode, just email me afterwards, gentlemen, with your size request, and I shall send you one for free as a nice thank you for being on the podcast. If you're looking for sizing, I'm 5'10", 175 pounds, and super jacked, and I wear a medium. But I'll send you a sizing chart afterwards. <laughs> That's helpful from template. I mean, the the sizing uh, information was top of mind this weekend. I don't know if the two of you with your international prowess were paying attention to the NFL Combine, the National Football League, and their fixation on Bryce Young's uh, height and weight. Uh, but you are not far off from Bryce Young, who was quarterback from Alabama and uh, has been criticized for being too short and too thin. Um, but you are, I think, I think he, I think he measured in at five, 10 and a half, uh, and 204 pounds, which gets him in the door as a viable quarterback in the NFL. He's a lot bigger than me. <laughs> <laughs> well, from a weight perspective, I think, from, yeah, but from a height perspective, technically you could be an NFL quarterback. Maybe. Yeah. And when I was running ultra marathons, my coach was like, you're too overweight. <laughs> 
<laughs> your VO2 max is good, but if you want to get the times, you need to drop another 15 pounds. And I was like, man, it ain't happening. <laughs> it ain't happening. I'm not getting down to 150. <laughs> well, like I don't know anything about this. I don't know anything about this space and I didn't watch the <clears> fight, <throat> but Ian, I, I would love, I know we'll actually get back to the manuscript here in a second, but did you, with your uh, propensity love for UFC, did you watch the John Jones fight at all? Like, what are your thoughts on him putting on the weight to go up to the next class? All those types of things. I did. I did indeed watch it. I think obviously John Jones is, you know, is um this, in the discussion of the greatest of all time, and he can't deny that. Um, he's got one loss in his record, which is technically a disqualification to Matt Hamill. Um, but um, I wouldn't call that a loss, really. I think it was. Uh, I think it was a great challenge for him. I think there's a couple of things before we talk about John Jones. I think the heavyweight division currently does not have a lot of elite grapplers or wrestlers in it. It's very striking dominant with Cyril Gann, Derek Lewis, Taitu Avasi, these guys. So when Stipe comes back into the heavyweight division, being a wrestler, it's going to be a different, um, or having a better wrestling base, it's going to be a different. Um, challenge for John Jones I actually thought John Jones didn't look that good physically I thought whilst he looked very big and he put on a lot of weight I thought he had a lot of body fat as well um, obviously there's a big discussion about you know does body fat percentage equal performance and I would argue that it doesn't actually I think skills and technique and other things do but I did think he looked fairly overweight and bloated in the octagon itself his stomach looked pretty um, he looked pretty he looked pretty big in saying that we only saw him for a couple of minutes, but I thought he moved pretty well. He still seemed to be able to move, but could he carry that through for five rounds? Would he have the aerobic capacity to carry that? I'm not too sure. I think he did a very clever game plan against Cyril Gann. He didn't stand and strike, which was Cyril's forte. He's been doing a lot of work with Henry Cejudo, the uh, former Olympic champion and former bantamweight champion and flyweight champion um, on wrestling. And he did very well to kind of leg ride him, control him. And he had an excellent arm in guillotine and really used the cage to his advantage to kind of C bend him into like a C shape to you know to get it out. I think the big the biggest thing I would have for Cyril Gann is he needs to obviously work on some wrestling defense or jujitsu defense at least. But um, I thought John Jones John Jones technically looked good, but I don't think we've seen enough to make a depiction or a or a, a kind of a, a kind of a I don't know what like a prediction of what he's going to be like in a heavyweight division. I think the steep F fight is going to be very very interesting. Yeah, that's my three minute overview. <laughs> and here's yeah. the UFC podcast brought to you by <laughs> Dr. Ian Dunican. <laughs> yeah, I do. I yeah, it was it was good. I think the big surprise on that card for me on the weekend was probably Valentina Shevchenko losing in the core main event. I didn't see that coming. I was completely off my pick there. I think Alexa Alexa Grasso did a phenomenal job. Great stand up. Great great striking. Really tight in the pocket. Took advantage of those situations. Well conditioned. Um, Valentina Shevchenko looked a bit tired maybe she hadn't trained right maybe she had an injury I'm not sure that was good and then the another big standout on that card was probably uh, Shavkat Ramanov from uh, born in Uzbekistan fights out of Kazakhstan he did a standing guillotine choke uh, a standing rear naked choke sorry of uh, Jeff Neal which was um, which was quite an interesting fight so yeah some good fights on the weekend don't get me started. You keep digressing me, Jesse. Before I was going to say philosophy. Now you have me on about MMA fights. Don't even start about Formula One because that was on the weekend too, and so it was rugby. <laughs> Tell me more about Formula One here, Ian. No, I can't. Kidding. I can't even talk about. It. I, I'll go mental. I'll be on. I'll be on a bender for an hour. All right, let's talk about this paper. <laughs> um, Sounds la good. Last week, so we're going to continue on with this paper on uh, sleep and performance. This is an excellent review that Jonathan and Jesse did uh, publish. Um, in the first episode, we were looking at a, a few different parts and uh, of the paper. And if you have missed that, please go back and listen to the first episode of that, which you can find there on the website or scrolling back through your podcatcher. So let's jump into this next section, which was on mental health. And we took a break here the last time because we did want to give this a bit of time because mental health in athletes is such an important aspect um, that that could, shouldn't be overlooked. Now, I know Michael Gradner has done some work in this previously. Um, you know, it's something that has emerged. There's been some papers actually coming out of rugby and contact sports about common mental health disorders as well and um, sleep disturbances and due to the potential head trauma. And actually on the weekend, <clears throat> as a nice segue of kind of MMA, I'd, on another podcast I, I was listening to, or maybe I was reading this actually about, there's some rugby players now even talking about not remembering like winning the World Cup um, from head trauma, um, they've had issues with sleeping um, they're you know they're very there's been obviously some mental health stuff that's come out in terms of like you know feeling suicidal and so this whole kind of relationship in the CTE head trauma sleep mental health 
So um, that's kind of some of the stuff that's been circulating in the media. But back to your paper, John, I'm keen to understand um, what you guys found in this and, and how it pertains to people listening. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, as you pointed out, an incredibly important aspect for all human beings, and particularly in the context of sport and performance as well, and one that gets brushed under the rug and has been largely neglected for eons, if you will, for insert long duration characterization. And I think a lot of that has been uh, just kind of the rub some dirt on it philosophy that often gets applied in sport where emotions and feelings are checked at the door or um, not of high interest. And that's led to a lot of suppression. It's almost in some ways kind of like a military culture, right? Like don't ask, don't tell is kind of the way it's been approached when it comes to mental health. Thankfully, I think over the last decade in particular, we've seen the emergence of some athletes come out and speak explicitly about the challenges that they faced in mental health. Uh, and that's opened the door for a more approachable discussion here, which is critical because sport and performance, as we saw in the research we found, will have a negative influence or can have a negative influence on mental health due to the stress, the unique demands of training itself, the perseverance and resiliency through injury and what that does on somebody's psyche, if you will. But in turn, somebody's mental health will have a significant influence on their ability to train, their motivation on that front, their ability to perform as well, their emotional regulation during competition, all those factors. So it's a bi-directional relationship yeah. between performance and mental health. And I think, Jonathan, truthfully, what we saw is that there's a deficiency. There's an absence of critical analysis when it comes to mental health within sport, within athletes. Well, I could not agree more with you on the fact that this is a uh, bi-directional relationship and also that finally uh, some athletes are speaking uh, speaking out about their, their challenge with, with mental health. The problem I have, though, is the feeling I get from the research, and I include ourselves in this, is we are describing the problem. So mental health may have an impact on your performance, and performance will have an impact on your mental health. And then we're happy and we tap ourselves on the back and say, see, we're doing a good job. We're talking about mental health. But essentially, we're not at a point in research where we are developing something that is implementable. And we're working, again, in things that we are trying to break as researcher, which is silos. So we're working with our lens of sleep, and then you have other people working with their lens of uh, kinesiology and so on and so forth. And I think that the future will reside into uh, incorporating or adding a uh, clinical psychologist to the drawing board in terms of this is what we find with, with depression and anxiety, just to name them. What would be the implementable uh, strategies to actually answer those questions and help those athletes? And, and we have enough data to say, well, this is a prevalent problem in athletes and student athletes. Now, I think we have enough data to demonstrate that one out of five student athletes or athletes are dealing with some sort of mental health. Hmm. Now it's the time for actual action instead of description, and we're not doing this. This is, um, this is an interesting point, Jonathan, because if you look at the general research that would say a lot of papers would show that, oh, if you have depression or anxiety, exercising three to four times a week for aerobic capacity is very good in terms of, you know, alleviating, I think again, 80% of people alleviating these symptoms of mental health. But obviously now that's not applicable to elite athletes who will be training far more than that. I think like the average elite athlete is probably training somewhere between 15 to 20 hours a week when we add it all up, if, if not even more. So this obviously doesn't translate. And I like your kind of, you know, so what kind of statement about we know this and we know this is happening, but what can we do about it? And I think this is the same actually in the general population. It's like, well, we're now kind of lowering the water table, so to speak, to understand that these rates of depression, anxiety, even sleep disorders, you know, 
you know, levels of obesity, people's general health. We know all this, but what what can we do about it? What can you know? What can we do, and what are we doing about it? This is where I like to start looking at some other things as well, where we kind of look from the west to the east. And I know Jesse, what you're you're at the University of Wisconsin. I know that group has been um, over the last thirty or forty years done done a lot of work with sort of Buddhism around. Um, I think it was the is it the Center for Consciousness Studies or is Richie? Um, can't think of his name. Do you remember, can you think yeah, of Richie Davidson. Richie uh, Davidson. I think it's now yeah. the Center for Healthy Minds. I think what Richie operates out of. Yeah, so they do. They, he's done a lot of work with the Dalai Lama from like the seventies and looking at sort of the um, more like kind of the, the physics and the consciousness application and um, people like him and Alan Wallace and so on have done a lot of work around this. So, what's your thoughts about? I know maybe not explicitly stated in the paper, but what's your thoughts about some of these kind of novel things that have been making their way to the West since the seventies? You know. And we see it being rebadged in business around mindfulness, but things like meditation, yoga, decentering, even we see Stoic, Stoic philosophy even emerging as well, which is a lot of parallels with Buddhism. What's what's your thoughts on that? Because I know you guys have got psychology backgrounds as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it's beautiful. Uh, I think it's wonderful that these things are infringing upon our Western culture. What I find unfortunate is our kind of rebranding and repackaging we tend to do with interventions, you know, whether it's dialectical behavioral therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy or acceptance and commitment therapy. A lot of the principles are, are very similar that we draw upon from the Eastern traditions, right? Acceptance, right? Meditation, mindfulness. We don't, I don't understand why we need to repackage them into these different terminologies from a complexity standpoint. They're extremely helpful from an acute and long-term psychological, cognitive functioning perspective. Let's just use the terms as they are. Let's use the terms of acceptance. Let's use the terms of mindfulness meditation. Let's adopt yogic practices. Let's center ourselves, those types of things. So I think we get caught up in the Western world still of making things seem more important than they actually are in some ways, like um, putting things on a pedestal rather than just like accepting the utility of them as they are, because they are extremely powerful tools. And I do think they're becoming more commonplace in sport performance as well. And it's not just the effects they'll have on mental health. I mean, one of the reasons we included this section was because of the intimate relationship between sleep and mental health. And so mindfulness itself will help you be more present, give you better emotional regulatory skills, and in turn, it also may be an ability to help de-escalate when you run into a emotional distressor at night, mm. recenter yourself and prepare yourself for sleep that in turn improves your sleep ability and quality and improves your mental health and that bi-directional relationship there. So I'm really encouraged that like these things are re-emerging, if you want to call it that in our Western world, but I'm still, my enthusiasm's tempered just because of what we do in the Western world, which is like, I need to come up with an awesome name so that I get all the attention. So this is the Jesse cook intervention to make you sleep better, feel good, do whatever. And therefore I get all the credibility. And I feel like that's what we do sometimes with these very common sense, longstanding practices. Well, I think that's just human nature. We want to kind of, you know, it's like the dog that pisses on the tree walking down the street. We want to kind of piss on a patch and make it our own. Jonathan, recently we spoke about, um, on a separate podcast, about your paper with ice hockey and the travel and, the, you know, the variation and sort of circadian rhythms and so on and, and, and this effect on it. And I can't help think about in this conversation, a bit like our previous conversations on Formula One and traveling around, to what extent does this We'll say either jet lag itself or social jet lag exacerbate these potentially underlying mental health issues, which may not be, um, they may be, the, the risk factors may be there, but they may not emerge until this person then reaches an elite elite level or a, a serious kind of you know Olympic level. But then with all the change and the variation and timing, the lack of sleep, the changes in sleep, the changes in sleep time and the lack of routine, the constant change of sleeping environments, this pressure cooker of being an, a, a high level athlete. To what extent may that kind of, you know, push up these mental health issues, you think? I think they would push up this by a wide margin, not to call it double. So if you're looking at the literature, 
in terms of if you sleep poorly, not long enough, or not uh, with a poor quality, uh, then your mental health and your performance are tanking. Now throw in the jet lag. We know that from jet lag literature that everything from a sleep perspective is being impaired or impede. The problem with this is we're assuming because as of today, I don't think we have an actual research that went and followed a team and then travel with the team and then pass a mental health questionnaire alongside a sleep questionnaire and say, okay, so how do you think that jet lag is impacting your mental health and then performance? And we could have a longitudinal uh, research from that standpoint. We are looking at assumption based from study one, study two, study three, study uh, and four, and making this a whole lot of thing about the jet lag. Having said that, we know now with the paper and the uh, the statistical approach that Jesse and Olivia the uh, use uh, for the paper that the quadratic uh, perspective is the right one and not the linear one. So my first paper included, we look at we're traveling east to west or west to east in a very linear way. You know as much as I do uh, that athletes are going east, west, east, west, east, west, north, south, and they're yeah. just going around the globe. So there is no directional place anymore. Maybe the NFL has it still because they're playing once a week. So having said that, to answer your question, I think jet lag plays a tremendous detrimental impact on performance and mental health. You have a new environment. You have you have maybe the adversity of being on the road. You don't have the fan on your side. You maybe don't have access to your own food. And you have everything going against you. So of course, even though you are a elite or professional athlete, this will impact you. Therefore, this is where I think mindfulness and acceptance will enter the game to actually lower that burden. But talking on the North American way of doing things, as long as you have not proven the utility beyond and beyond for a professional athlete, they won't do it. So right now, the, the talk of the talk is please sleep and please recover. So ice bath, massage, physio, and all of these things that you see emerging, they're all doing it. We have Alex Auerbach that's working with the, uh, with the Raptors and he is a big advocate on mental health and doing these mindfulness uh, practice, these acceptance practice, making sure that your mental game is uh, par. And this is what I believe in the next five, 10 years will separate the elite of the elite. So the 98, 100% of athletes to the 95, 94. So LeBron James will be among them. And you'll have just below him, the other guy that everyone wants on this team but is not quite LeBron James. And I think the difference is that mindfulness, ability of uh, doing visualization before games to make sure that the uh, environmental uh, factor do not impact you, whether you're at home or on the road. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's um, a case going forward, a bit like what we discussed previously in sleep for more of an individualized approach? So for example, at the start of competitive season or a period, that we do screen athletes for not just these sleep problems, but these potential coexistent mental health problems. And then true, obviously to be group education or group interventions, but then we sort of divide and conquer and we put people into maybe different bins or stratify them and go, well, Jonathan needs this support. Maybe an app's going to work for him, but then also as well, looking at a bit more broadly. So, you know, maybe, you know, we got, so, cause some people will actually be opposed to this. Some people, and I've had these conversations, Oh, I'm not doing meditation. That's like some sort of Buddhist satanic thing. I'm like, what are you talking about? Meditation. Okay. Maybe it's got its roots in Buddhism and Taoism, but it's not satanic. So would we kind of potentially, and I know we're crossing over here into probably religious affiliations and so on, but how can we kind of augment those to people's personal beliefs? Cause some people are just dead opposed to ending outside of Christianity, Judaism, Islam, whatever it might be. So how can we ensure that we either augment them to their personal beliefs or to completely secularize these things and show them that there isn't a religious connotation because some people just don't understand the difference and that, that might well be one challenge. word one word only education this is where you'll find your roots so by educating people athletes everyone uh where uh mindfulness is coming from and how it can be helpful this is how you're going to augment its uh, utility and usage you will always have that 
athletes or individuals that will not hear anything you want to tell them. And you know what? This is why the individualized approach is so important. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to shove down the throat of every of your athlete that mindfulness is the way and the only way to achieve top performance, you will lose the same way as everyone should be in a high bath after this or after that. Yeah, yeah. This is not how you approach and optimize recovery and performance. It's through education and individualization. So this is how I find it. I find it so simple that we are able to complicate it ourselves. This is what human beings do. They take something simple and they make it complicated. Mindfulness is through education. Recovery is through education. And then you try to individualize the best approach for every athlete. If you have an athlete dealing with depression and he's on, I don't know, well, butrin, are you going to approach him the same way uh, an athlete that has no mental health issue? I sure hope not, but you need to know that before the season so you can tailor your approach. Yeah, I, I fully agree on that front. I think it's what you're unpacking there, Ian, is a really delicate subject of these kind of um, underlying relationships we have with kind of secular beliefs or different ideologies, whatever it may be, because we all come from different cloths. And when you get into a, a domain like sport and you're trying to determine strategies for all, you have to be mindful of the various different beliefs and, and perspectives on that front. And it's, it's very, very challenging there for sure. And I do think Jonathan's answer is great. In practice, though, I don't know, Jonathan, how that really comes to be, because how much education is necessary to get somebody to recognize that like, sitting there and being attentive to your breath is not anything religious, but really a strategy you can use to recenter. In theory, I just did that in five seconds, but for some, that's not enough. So how much education will be necessary to substantiate these techniques, I think is a real delicate challenge. And I think a big thing I wanted to talk about here, Ian, too, is like, Mental health characteristics or characteristics of mental health problems aren't always problems, right? They're only problems when they cause dysfunction, hmm. right? And a lot of athletes get to where they are because of quote unquote pathological characteristics, whether that be a fear of failure, perfectionism, OCD characteristics, neuroticism, certain personality traits that lead individuals more susceptible to mental health disorders. So I think a delicate boundary becomes when do you intervene? For who do you intervene? Uh, because you have no chance intervening with a guy like Michael Jordan. That guy is stuck in his way of being ruthless and a savage, yeah. right? And like completely devoted to his craft 24 hours a day, 25 hours if he had that 25th hour. He doesn't, but he tries to get it, right? And like for me, I we all to some degree have a core belief of like a fear of failure or something like that. Mine may be a little bit heightened relative to others. That actually helps me succeed, but it's being aware of that, not necessarily modifying it, but being aware of it. And so I think this is an interesting uh, point that we have to approach with sport because we don't want to tell people to downregulate across the board because that may actually hinder their performance. Mm -hmm this is what's led them to get to where they are. It also just may lead them to being more susceptible to having episodic situations that are, you know, now on classifying as a mental health disorder. Yeah. Like we were talking about John Jones a moment ago. Let's like, there's a classic example. John Jones been in out of media for the last 10, 15 years doing cocaine, you know, got done with steroids or, you know, tainted supplements, whatever he was, you know, crazy things that he does. And what makes John Jones crazy is what makes him great as well. And you can go back and watch interviews of John Jones, and it is truly Jekyll and Hyde. He can come into that octagon and he can do interviews and like, I'm going to fucking kill everybody. I'm going to fucking do that. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that in pre-interviews. Or he can be like, you know, like he did on Sunday. The first thing I want to do is thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's like, you don't know what you're going to get. Are you going to get the the dark side John Jones that wants to kill everybody and is ruthless. Are you going to get the, the light? You know, God is helping me. I am this, I am blessed. So again, like you could look at him and go, man, is he like, is he bipolar? Is he schizophrenic? Is it multiple personality disorder? Is it what? But either way, it makes him a savage, the greatest of all time MMA athlete that ever walked the planet. And there's no denying that. 
And that's why I was saying earlier on, all these things can coexist. And I yeah, hear I mean, you're yeah, right I mean, on this. And the, the thing with athletes is you don't want to control them. You want to guide them. So knowing these extreme about John Jones, the example you use, or Michael Jordan, again, I'm going back on how you do individualize your approach. You know their boundaries, and it's to guide them through those boundaries that you will make them great and keep them great. Now, the other question is, well, is that ethical? Because you're doing this uh, for your team uh, and for your organization, and it may be to a detriment to the uh, individual. Again, this will be another uh, topic we can go on, but in terms of athletic uh, performance, knowing the boundaries of your athletes, your job is to guide them to reach the top performance they can. You don't want to control them or, or prevent them from doing anything if that's gonna make them as great as they are. So John Jones, maybe sometimes you do want the dark side of John Jones. Maybe sometimes you don't need it, but at the end of the day, this is what was gonna make him win. And same for Michael Jordan. Some days you needed the savage Michael Jordan on the court and other days, well, you know what? You can maybe put to rest a savage Michael Jordan and you're still gonna win. And that way you are guiding those athletes to great performance after great performance after great performance. So it's not a controlling the mental health aspect, it's guiding it. Beautiful. And I don't wanna piggyback on that comment. I want to steer back to the the time zone challenge that most athletes face, uh, because I know that was your initial question there, Ian, that led us kind of down this road. And uh, I want to kind of unpack a little bit further this quadratic relationship that Jonathan described. Um, and basically, a lot of the literature, when we form this team between Dr. Amy Bender, Dr. Olivia Walsh, Jonathan, myself, we kept seeing that most of the analyses were looking with the assumption that it was either kind of this raw time zone change where you're going three time zones one way or six time zones, whatever it may be, and looking at relationships in performance based on those changes. And it was assumed based on certain practices in sport, for instance, like in the National Football League, it's common for teams to play at noon. Mm -hmm. Um and a West Coast team in the United States traveling to the East Coast, say like the Arizona Cardinals going to play the Buffalo Bills for that game, it's generally assumed, and this has been something that sports betters have hammered for a while, that the Cardinals are going to have a disadvantage for that noon game because they're traveling East, their circadian rhythm's not going to be in an ideal spot for performance relative to that East Coast team, right? But say, for instance, the Buffalo Bills were traveling to play the Cardinals for, say, like Sunday night football, where it's happening at 7 p.m. on a Sunday night in Arizona, the Cardinals will probably have the advantage. We haven't gotten to that granularity. Our team really approached it more from a, hey, circadian misalignment is a problem. That literature is well established, that when we're misaligned with our environmental time, our bio biological clock and our environmental clock are misaligned. Psychological, physical, cognitive issues emerge. And that's what this quadratic approach kind of teases apart is it's really not about a directional thing one way or another. It's about more about constantly being in a state of circadian misalignment. Um, and I think that's something that Jonathan was describing there with athletes where they're just jumping around from spot to spot and there's no stability. So their circadian biology is a mess, for lack of a better term. So th this might be a, a, we'll probably just jump a paragraph here in the paper. We might just jump to this area, which is about travel and time zone change and the negative influence on sleep that affects performance before we talk about competitive performance. So this might be a nice segue into that. So <clears throat> obviously, there's, as you said there, Jesse, there's a number of papers on this. Jonathan's done some work as well. Um, he's been on the podcast before talking about this, but hockey players as well. We've seen this as well in some of the work that we've done here in, in Perth and Western Australia, led by Tim Smitty. He's looking at the Western Force and so on. So this is a this is a significant issue that I really think, despite the research, I don't think teams still take it seriously. I think they just think like, oh, you just get over it. You just kind of like, that's just what we do. You know, you just work hard and you push on. And I still hear people talk about getting over jet lag is well you just got to push on with it you just got to get up and get on with it it's like what the fuck does that mean like and you got guys getting up the next morning at six o'clock after landing at 2 a.m 
push in, push in, push in. Like this, you know, just got to get going. Just got to, got to exercise hard. Like, it's like, oh man, like this is crazy. It's either that or take copious amounts of melatonin before you go to bed. And they seem to be the only two things. And I think we come back to your point on education, Jonathan. You know, I think, the, 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 I know it's not science to say that. It's, it's bro science on these podcasts saying that. So it's, it's an interesting area that we should probably look at for a few minutes because, um, yeah, if you get this wrong, it can really impact your performance. Oh, they're coming. So there are some some changes that we can see. So, for, for example, in the uh, National Hockey League, uh, surprisingly, it was John Tortorella, one of the most uh, old school coach that decided to uh, stop the uh, morning skate because he was letting his athletes sleep. Yeah. Uh, you have other uh, athletes that are traveling with their own private uh, plane a day in advance when they can. So now the old school people will say, well, this is bad for team chemistry. Uh, chemistry. Uh, in baseball, you'll see uh, sometimes the rotation uh, pitcher going uh, one day in advance. So it's, it's making its way into the, uh, the sport. And, and for you guys down in Australia, the, the rugby, I mean, going to South Africa and Argentina is just, just out of this world for us. But going back to the education piece, it will be important, but I think we have to demonstrate that not only does the, uh, this jet lag have a detrimental impact, they know it. They're tired of us telling them, well, if you don't do this, here's what's going to happen. You're going to tank your performance. Now we're at a point, no, here's what you need to do to actually protect yourself from that detriment of performance and, in, and to improve it. Once again, we're very good at telling people what not to do, but we are not that good to tell people what to actually do with our result. And this is where I think we have difficulty sometimes penetrating the professional sport because, well, you're just like the next guy. The nutritionist or the uh, strength and coach, uh, strength and conditioning uh, guy, you're just going to tell me what not to do and what I'm doing is not right. Now, please educate me and tell me what should I do. And this is where I think sleep uh, scientists, sleep clinicians, sleep researchers are faced with is we know exactly what not to do. Now, here's what you should do when you want to uh, prepare your season of traveling. And here's plan A, plan B, and plan C. And according to this, you should have a uh, above two victory compared if you're not doing this. Well, now you're talking their language because two victory in the National Hockey League could mean a spot in the playoff. A spot mm -hmm. in the playoff means millions of dollars back into the team organization. Now, not only are you talking performance, but you're talking also money. But we're not doing it yet. Yeah. I, I really like that point, Jonathan, about telling people what not to do. Um, because that is such a problem. And I think it's not just in sport, it's in industry as well, from a health, a safety, a productivity point of view. Don't do this, don't do that. And people just get pissed off. And then they can kind of go, well, what's the point? I'll just turn up, turn my brain off, and I'll just tap away. And I think that, that happens with athletes as well. Just go, what's the point in coming up here? Because Jonathan tells me every Monday that I'm not getting my seven to nine hours sleep. And he's just going to come out with these 20-minute spiel of shit every week that I have to listen to. So and it just makes me feel like crap. Where, and, uh, you know, where we need to, one, individualize, but two, we need to put, I think, a positive spin on it. And I think telling people, you know, the opposite, when can I drink coffee? When can I go and I have a beer? What's the best time to eat? What's the best time to train? Using positive reinforcement language, because as humans, we'll respond to that. You keep telling people what not to do, they'll just disengage. They'll just completely. And then when you do have something that you really want to tell them not to do, they won't be listening. Because like just here comes another negative reinforcement. But if you're primarily positive and you do come out with a negative, they'll be like, oh, that's our character for Jonathan or Jesse. So I'll actually pay attention here where you go, look, guys, it's imperative now from this week that we do not do this on Saturday night because we need to do this for the playoffs on Sunday, for example. Like that's when you pull out the big gun and you kind of go, whoa, stop. You know, it's a bit like people, I think that um you see the parents constantly like pulling the kid back, you know, every, everywhere to go, don't touch that, don't do this, don't do that. And then when they say don't, like it could be the day where they nearly get hit by a truck and the kid just thinks everything's a risk. So they've got no ability to kind of risk stratify or make decisions themselves. Yeah, you should follow me on my parenting podcast as well. I was going to say, we can do a parent corner to still to steer, <laughs> still steal from uh, Bill Simmons. I really like that. But Rule, rule um, one, beat your kids. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I'll I'll let that sit. Um, anyways, <laughs> uh, I I fully agree with with both of you on that front. Like we need to be directive, um, rather than like shaming, blaming, guilt, those types of things that can come from saying don't do this. But in the context of travel for sport teams or sport individuals, it gets complicated, right? We're dealing with constraints. We're dealing with a schedule that we don't construct ourselves. Um, as Jonathan alluded to, there are some changes in these professional organizations at this point, trying to be more mindful of reducing the deleterious effects of travel and being more considerate about one's well-being because the time zone changes, but they're still out there. I don't know what the averages are, but it's like a non-trivial amount of NBA teams play back-to-back games that are in different locations. Um, a non-trivial amount of games. I think we're talking like eight to 10 where they're playing one night and traveling the next or traveling that night and going like, for example, last night, the Boston Celtics played at home. They lost. It actually was a double overtime game. So that's something that's unexpected from a time duration that throws a wrench into your travel plans. And tonight I think they're playing in Cleveland. So they went from Boston to Cleveland and We can sit there and be like, okay, so like with this on the schedule, I think it makes the most sense for you to travel at this time. You probably want to let them sleep till then, maybe do some bright light at this point, so on and so forth. But then the game goes to double overtime and everything gets thrown for a loop at that point. Um, So there's just the complexity of things we cannot account for. But that was something that we as a research group and a team wanted to get to. We were hopeful we were trying to track down an actual flight plan from a professional team and then use the great and powerful skills of the uh, Dr. Olivia Walsh, who has some really amazing AI and machine learning skills to maybe cultivate an optimal strategy for travel that tries to minimize circadian misalignment. So trying to be in circadian neutral as much as possible from a biological perspective. We never got there. But I think that's where the research should try and go to give more direct information back to these teams of like, here's the goal. The goal is to be at this circadian neutral when you're for whatever environment you're playing in. And this is the strategies you're going to use to do that. And some of that's the timing of travel. You're going to travel on this day at this time or try to during that travel. Here's what you're going to do as well. When you land, here's what you're going to do as well and go from there. And yeah, sometimes. We'll have to loosen the grips on the actual recommendations because things change. But as you both pointed out, that's where we need to go rather than be like, it's essential you get your optimal sleep to perform well. It's essential that you're mindful of time zone changes when you're doing this. Maybe rest your players on back-to-backs when you're traveling. We need to give more precise recommendations and direction. Um, And we're just not there yet. Yeah, I I fully agree. I think that's... um... That's an excellent way to to move forward. To what degree have we uh, in the scientific community or from the papers you looked at been able to incorporate any individualistic, if you want to call it that, uh, sleep problems or clinical sleep disorders into the management of jet lag? Has has that been done? To To my knowledge, no. To my knowledge, there's absolutely no indication from a research perspective that this is being done. From a clinical perspective, yes, this is being done. We know that some athletes are working with sleep clinicians to have their travel managed, to have their this and that managed. But from a research perspective, we don't have any data. So that that I'm, I'm sure of. So I'll give you my example. I'm dealing with Olympic athletes every year. So yes, they do receive uh travel plan yes they do receive sleep management plan yes they do receive recovery plan from when they're traveling the globe so this i know that it's being done is there an actual research on this not to my knowledge should it yes it should so everyone that is interested you know my email <laughs> so, so so jonathan from a from a practical standpoint of view because look the other thing as well as we don't always have to be this is a misnomer, we think, because it's not research or not peer reviewed that it's not happening. Sometimes industry and application and business is, is years ahead, right, of, of what's going on in the research. So let's not kid ourselves either. It's sometimes it's about funding and timing and so on. And the whole, you know, I think <laughs> laborious 
inadequate process of getting a paper published as well that doesn't promote dialogue and discussion but anyway that's another topic for another 15 part episode on my annoyance with the peer review publication process um, and h indexes as we talk, spoke about before but from a practical standpoint of view jonathan you are potentially if i'm an athlete and i'm coming to you for help you will meet with me interview me talk about my sport understand what i'm doing will you then you know uh, assess me for a sleep disorder by using maybe pre pre screening questionnaires, then maybe doing an overnight PSG in the lab or at home just to make sure to rule what rule these in or out. As, do you have a kind of a set methodology that you use? And yes. Then move into actigraphy over the season and then like jet lag plan. Yes, there is there is set 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 points to go through. So first, you will have an appointment with a sleep physician. So we can rule out a uh, primary sleep disorder. If we suspect sleep apnea, yes, you all, you either have a level three, two, or one, depending on on the uh, pretest probability. Uh, and then you'll have a, an appointment with me so we can look at the uh, behavioral management, the travel management. And while you're traveling, you always have access to me if you have a problem. So right now I know I have athletes uh, in France and in uh, Austria because they're they're a skier. If they have a question or they're, they're, they're encountering sleep problem, they can contact me and we do Zoom. Uh, and we have the sleep physician that was there at the first meeting that is also managing the, uh, the drugs or the medication if needed. So all of this is put into motion for every athlete that come and see us. So it's not only the behavioral management, it's the entire thing that is being covered from drug management to sleep disorder uh, screening to behavioral management, traveling plan, recovery plan. And when you're back uh, at home soil, you also have a recovery plan, a buffer zone of the week or two, and then off you go in off season. So this is what I'm talking about when I'm saying this is a individualized approach. Yeah, I think your, your process there is very similar to what I do. And I use partners in terms of like sleep physicians who want to do a very similar approach. Do you think Jonathan that's worked actually publishing as a methodology or is that too much of a, an IP issue for people? Um, do you think there should be a defined process of what goes on to, to highlight the importance of all these steps? Because, and the reason I say this is because I see other people who deal with athletes or shift workers, whatever, and they just sit down and go, here's 10 top sleep tips. And you're like, you haven't even spoken about all these other things like organizational factors, travel, family, sleep disorders, sleep problems, existing medical conditions. Here's 10 sleep tips. And that's all it keeps coming back to. Well, here 10 sleep tips is the uh, next title of my presentation. But having said oh, that... Sorry, I have to, have to go off after the end is Jesse. <laughs> so having said that... Yes, we, we could go on and, and try to describe what would be the best approach to manage an athlete or a team. But from a research perspective, again, who's your control group to prove that you're right? Yeah. So I, 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 I guess everyone tries to do what they believe it's best. There's a common sense that a physician should always be on board for drug management. There's a sleep clinician that should be on board for behavioral management. And then depending on the type of athlete you're dealing with, do you really want them to have a ring or an actograph on them? Uh, please do not put all your athlete in level one to screen for whatever oh, you're trying to screen. Waste of, waste of time, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So in terms of trying to develop the best approach, I think it would be very, very subjective and tainted with a lot of common sense. But in terms to dig down from a research perspective, I think it's nearly impossible. What do you think, Jesse? I mean, I think a big characteristic that we haven't even discussed captures the impossibility of this at this current stage, and that's the circadian rhythm component of this. You know, even in your battery there, Jonathan, there's no assessment really at the granular level of the biological chronotype. We can do, we can use short form questionnaires like the reduced morning evenness questionnaire or the Munich chronotype as a proxy into one's chronotype, but that's diurnal preference or circadian preference, yes. one's tendency to be more morningness or eveningness. And generally at the population level, that's going to smooth out and map on to chronotype. But we're talking about optimal performance here. And we're talking about traveling time zones and making personalized, precise interventions, right? And so I need to know if player A or player B, when their dim light melatonin onset is. 
And that's not something we're building in at all right now, because that's going to change the dynamics of an intervention. And whether or not I tell Jonathan to put this bright light on him at this time and player B to put this bright light on them at this time, right? Um, A great paper just came out in the journal Sleep, Stephanie Crowley, that was looking at, oh, I think you were thinking about different paper, Jonathan, but Stephanie Crowley's paper that was looking at advancing uh, adolescence circadian rhythm to potentially afford more, a longer bedtime and more sleep time to address the adolescent kind of sleep health crisis. And it's a very more proof of concept design where they're bringing people into lab and showing, shining light on the weekends at their nadir, things like that. Um, so maybe not real world applicable, but what they found is that one, there's variability in the dim light melatonin onset for adolescents, even though the default perspective is that adolescents shift into eveningness, not every adolescent. Yeah. And what they found too, is that those who were delayed responded well to the intervention were those that had more of an advanced dim light melatonin onset or neutral didn't respond as much. And so that's the nuance that we need to know when making such recommendations or guidelines when working with athletes. And so regardless of sleep characteristics, we also have to know the circadian characteristics. And that's why I find this right now, at least a bit impossible. I am optimistic that advancements in wearable technology and accessibility of those biosignals may be able to help us here progress. But right now it just seems too complicated um, to really get the data we need to make personalized recommendations for athletes, let alone clients that come into your clinic anyways, Jonathan. I, I, I think this is a very interesting area. And Sean Kane, who's at Monash University, has been doing a lot of work on this in terms of light sensitivity and individual sort of setups as well, more from a probably a performance standpoint than like control rooms, shift workers, mental health, as opposed to performance for athletes. But it's all applicable as well where basically light sensitivity is determined and, you know, the chronotype and so on. And then you can actually use light strategically to shift people in these different directions. Because I think you're right, Jesse. I think um, the limitation is, and Jonathan, I think you said this here as well, the questionnaires are preference and that could be designed around your lifestyle. I think we discussed this briefly in part one of this. The other thing is we could use mid-sleep from actigraphy, but again, that just gives us the habits that they may be doing anyway. Um, So that would give us maybe an indication of what's happening in their life. But if you do a test, you know, looking at the the Dilmo, like for as example, example, um, Jesse, that you were saying, we might find that the person is preferences for morningness, but they're actually an eveningness person. So they're completely diametrically opposed. And then then they're wondering why, you know, they're feeling like shit. And maybe the physicians put them on modafinil for daytime sleepiness. When in actual fact, if we just aligned them to their preference, we wouldn't need that medication. And we'd solve a lot of problems at the root cause. So this is where it gets kind of complex and where the top 10 sleep tips don't actually work. You can keep banging on about sleep hygiene and you can keep, keep taking a simplistic approach, but until you do these type of things, you're never going to solve that. I think this is where we need to go a little bit more with sleep. We need to start getting at the root cause of issues for people. Because I had a guy last week just ask me some questions about like he can't sleep at night and he's stressed and blah, 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 and work and so on. Further conversation, maybe an hour in, He's having 10 espresso shots a day. Okay, I like to, let's start there. Before we start putting you into the laboratory, let's start looking at that, you know, because 10 espresso shots across the day, I don't know. I would maybe hypothesize that maybe impacting your sleep. Not too sure. <laughs> Sarcastic tone. <laughs> so yeah, it's these type of things you need to look at. Yeah, fully agree. Those are the low hanging fruits, right? Yeah. And like, we're at a point where we, for some reason, overlook those. And we feel a necessity to be more grandiose in the intervention, if you will. But the reality is sleep's a biological necessity. Our bodies are actually really good at it. If we can get out of the way and like do things generally pretty decently, the body's going to be pretty good at sleep. And we forget that. And so we've now reached this new age era that I'm fearful will penetrate into the sport world even further where people are trying to engineer sleep. They're trying to take this and that. And if I don't do this, and if I take it 10 minutes later, then I won't be able to sleep or whatever it may be. And the reality is 
let it go. Let it go. And just try and do enough things right across your day that afford you the opportunity to have sleep find you and to have good ability and quality of sleep. This is where the biohacking bullshit has like, you know, overcome, I think for a lot of people, this kind of, you know, I've had loads of people as well. Oh yeah. I've done that thing where you get up at four o'clock every morning, like, you know, Jocko or Tim Ferriss or Mark Wahlberg or whatever. And then I go to work and I'm fucked by 10 AM. I'm like, yeah. And then they go, so why can Mark Wahlberg do it? And I always go, well, one, maybe it's lies. Maybe they're not telling you the truth. Right. So I don't believe everything you see on TV or the internet or whatever. And two, they probably have jobs that allow them to nap during the day. Because I'm sure Mark Wahlberg, if he wants to just like, you know, take a break, he can. He's not staying awake for 18 hours a day. And he's in his 40s and he looks jacked. Or he might even be in his 50s. Maybe he's doing a few supplements from south of the border that are not legal. So let's look at all this, guys, in its totality. And let's not be sold a lemon because we have a great habit of just believing everything that's pumped out to us, you know? So there's a lot of... um sheep-like behavior, I think, when it comes to this stuff. Um, and it's really interesting because you look at these people on the internet and they're giving out all this sleep info and they've got like thousands of followers. And then you look at some of the people in our circle who we would classify as some of the best sleep scientists in the world and they've got like 200 followers on Instagram. And you're like, the fucking world is diametrically opposed here, guys. This is crazy. The experts aren't getting a platform and the non-experts are getting a platform. It's the complete Dunning-Kruger curve inversed out into the public. It's bizarre. So... Yeah, that's kind of a word of caution for people listening. It's like, you know, don't don't believe everything out there because there's a lot of shit out there. Yeah, uh, just to piggyback on that, I want to pull up the paper if I can quickly, but I don't know if I'll be able to. Rebecca B- Robbins just published a great paper on that about the misinformation oh, really? on sleep in kind of social media. Um, let's see if I can find that real quick. Rebecca Jonathan, Robbins. say something. No, you don't have yeah, to I, I saw this. I saw the paper, and she went on where and who's telling the uh, the misinformation. And this paper is phenomenal. Oh. And there's there's only one. There's one that came up to mind when you were talking, Ian. It's this. There's there's this person in on Twitter that says that 99 percent of their problem was resolved because she was now getting up at 5 a.m. Oh. <laughs> and then you have. You have Dr. Wu who came back and said, well, I can't wake up at 5 a.m. And I don't advise you do this. And and I'm just see, you have a very prominent researcher telling you not to do it, but you have a someone from the uh, corporate world telling you that 99% of our problem was resolved by waking up at 5. And now you're going to have thousands of people trying to wake up at 5 and go on with their day and they're going to be screwed by the end of the day. So this is the uh, sad truth of the sleep bros that you can find on Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. Uh, and yeah, they're trying to, as Jesse mentioned, engineer sleep into something it's not. And then we're going to have a wave, a massive wave of orthosomnia. Yeah, and I think it's, well said. It's, it's been becoming a commodity. It's a sales tactic because they know that people are sleep deprived and so they're jumping on it. It's like nutrition as well. People jumping on and off. And yeah, you're going to get some people are going to have phenomenal results like on the keto diet. I know people have done the keto diet and they felt like shit and got sick and they were constantly, their blood sugar was out of whack and whatever. And again, it comes back to this individual variability. And I think sometimes with the people like, oh, I get up every morning at five o'clock. And then I'm in bed by half nine. That's great. You've got what we call here a regular sleep pattern, which you probably never had before. So maybe it wasn't the time awake that was the, um, maybe it wasn't the issue that you were tired the whole time. It was you had no anchor point at the time awake or the time at sleep onset. And as you guys have known in psychology as well, one of the first things you got to look at is sleep routine to stabilize people's mood, performance, behavior, and so on, whether it be the time at wake or this time at sleep onset. And generally, it's easier to manipulate the time at wake because you just said to people, get out of bed at six, five, seven, whatever it is, and just get up and get going. And what that does then is drives that, you know, that wakefulness, that homeostatic drive for sleep across the day, which makes that person tired by 9 or 10 p.m., which ensures they're going to go to bed. So it kind of gets back into some of the cognitive behavioral therapy stuff as well for insomnia. So some of it is is simplistic, but in and that might be a sleep tip about regular sleep stuff, but that doesn't mean that everything that's going to work for everybody because you keep getting me up at five o'clock every morning. My chronotype, my preference, my biological chronotype, and my lifestyle, I'm going to be wrecked. I can do it maybe one or two days, but I'm I can't do that every day. So you know, 
it's it, it's fascinating. Yeah, the devil's in the details. And uh, yeah, so I found the paper. It's it was published uh, and I put it in the chat for us, but it's called Examining Understandability, Information Quality, and Presence of Misinformation in Popular YouTube Videos on Sleep Compared to Expert-Led Videos. Um, and this, this is, is clip from the topic. abstract. Yeah. Yeah. The most popular videos received an average 8.2 million views. Again, 8.2 million views. Jesus Whereas the Christ. expert led videos received an average of 0.3 million views. So 8.2 million versus 0.3 million. Yet commercial bias was identified in two thirds of popular videos and 0% of expert videos. You know what's great about this, Jesse, is that. If nothing else, this will this will actually give me some data to why this podcast is doing so shit. <laughs> <laughs> You're not talking enough about lettuce water and uh, you know whatever witchcraft is being proposed on TikTok and things like that. Did you know if you stick but your again, finger, it, if you stick your finger in your eye, you'll sleep better every two weeks. <laughs> but again, this demonstrate one sad thing is how poor researcher and sleep clinician mm. are doing of a job of reaching the public. We talk among ourselves of what we should do, what we should not do. We have our gig on the side, but in terms of reaching out the public and helping them, we're doing a crap job. This is what this paper is telling us also. She's absolutely right. Dr. Robbins, I absolutely right saying that there's a lot of misinformation out there and here's, here's the number to prove it. The other story that she's not fitting, and I haven't read the, the paper entirely, is researchers are doing a very poor job to disseminate their information out there. Yes. Yeah. So this is the sad reality. We know the message. We just don't know how to convey it to the general public. So it's, it's interesting you said this, Jonathan, because I have been asked before, why do you do the podcast? And I said, there's a couple of reasons why I do the podcast. The first thing is self-interest. I do the podcast so I can have these conversations with people like yourselves where I can explore a paper, because where else would, when else would we get an hour or two to have an uninterrupted conversation? But under the umbrella or the guise of the podcast, people will actually come to the party and have these discussions. So one, self-interest. And self-interest actually drives more interest, right? So you can have a, it can be beneficial for multiple parties, but if it interests me, it's definitely going to probably interest other people. So one is self-interest. It keeps me ahead of the literature and keep engaged. Two is, to your point, Jonathan, I think that actually universities and institutions do a shithouse job of communicating our research. That's why I like what Jesse's doing with the other podcast for um, uh, the Sleep Research site in the US, where that doesn't happen here. There's no, the Australian Sleep Association isn't doing that here. The Chronobiology Society isn't doing it here. The... Um, uh, the universities aren't doing it here. Yes, they've got a media thing, but it's just a bit of clickbait to put out onto general media. There's no dissemination. People aren't going to these universities for YouTube and online stuff. There might be physical lectures that people can go to. So I think in some ways, the universities themselves are about 20 years behind. On top of that, I don't think there's funding out there that allows for this to happen. So there's there's not, um, you know, I, and I don't know enough about the funding model, but is there like, can you apply for a million dollars worth of funding that will then have a top up of $200,000 to disseminate that information? Probably, probably not. You know, are you, are you rewarded or encouraged to have a YouTube channel as part of your lab, either via your company or your institution or via government grants? Probably not again. So the people that are actually doing the promotion of stuff like this with a low number of people listening are probably the people who are genuinely interested in promoting out stuff. Some of the bigger podcasts, the, the, the episodes are just riddled with ads and product placement. And I'm not going to call out any of them. I think we all know who they are, but it's, it's, it's interesting. And then you've got people who've never researched in the area of sleep, but might have another health background, constantly talking about sleep. Now, I'm not saying they can't, but people just need to recognize that when they go to those podcasts, that the person they're listening to may have never actually researched sleep or they might research sleep, but only in a laboratory-based setting. So they have basically no probably um, credit or credibility, sorry, for talking about athletic performance, but they've only done sleep restriction studies in a lab ad administering modafinil or something the next day. I don't know. I'm not knocking people, but I'm just saying this is the reality of, of what goes on. And I think you're right, Jonathan. We need to do a better job of promoting it. 
but so do these institutions that are around us as well. They need to help us too because they're in the dark edges. They're completely in the dark ages. And I've had conversations with Sleep Labs and other collaborations about doing podcasts and stuff. And they're like, oh no, we don't want to be giving out IP. Not giving out fucking IP. You're giving out like five slides on or a little talk on what you've done. It's just, it's a, it's a, it's a scarcity mindset where we should be thinking in abundance. We should be giving out as much as we can. The more I give out on these platforms, the more I do, the more work I actually get. Think in abundance. Well, Let's raise the level of education, not fucking dumb it down. End of rant number seven. Well, you nailed it. You nailed it. <laughs> and I mean, the bigger, the biggest issue here too is it's not just about misinformation on these social platforms. We have an unregulated sleep coaching space, at least here in the United yes. States, where over people. The world. Yeah, is it? It's, I don't know yeah. how it applies elsewhere. I know the Society of Behavioral Sleep Medicine is trying to institute some guidelines. Yeah, I feel you, Jonathan. At some point, maybe there may be credentials required to become a certified sleep coach, but just about any single person can operate under that classifier, if you will, and make money where some are charging up to $400, $500 US dollars for a singular session. And at best, they're a sleep scientist at best. Oh. In those spaces, <laughs> and you're talking a very, a very small number of them that actually have any training in sleep. Yeah, absolutely. And what you you took the word, you hit the word on perfectly earlier. Ian, this is predatorial. People like have heard the widespread prevalence of sleep problems in society. Commercial agencies are like, great. Let's okay. find anything we can throw into a product, market it in a way that looks all pretty in a shiny little box, tell people they're going to sleep great. And then they don't afterwards. Hmm. Uh, and then they lose faith in other interventions downstream with clinicians, things of that nature. Sleep health coaches may be able to give you some guidelines on sleep hygiene, things like that, but to what degree? And are they going to be able to pick up on what we discussed earlier of your insomnia is actually due to circadian misalignment or your insomnia, as Jonathan and I are focusing on right now, may be due to an underlying sleep disorder breathing that's being misperceived as insomnia, right? These people aren't able to do that. And so they're not actually just giving false information. They may be doing harm in certain situations by applying certain strategies when it's completely contraindicated. So that's my rant for the day is that we need to do better about sleep health coaches, not just the information that's being projected into the space, but the people who are providing quote unquote care. Yeah. I, I, it's the same issue down here in Australia, Jesse. It's in industry. It's with athletes. It's with the general population. And I don't know what it's going to take to change it. I really don't. I, I don't know where it's going to take some massive incident, someone dying, someone being brought to court. I don't even, I don't, I don't even know if that'll change it. I, I don't really know, but I do think that we do need to have some sort of accreditations for people that are doing coaching or consulting. Um, because if you were an engineer, uh, you would have a, or a chartered accountant, a chartered engineer, you have these professional bodies. And that's the first thing we need to do to, to stop this misinformation thing. We need to start putting that ring fence around what we do and saying, within these classifications, you know, here's a sleep tech, here's a researcher, here's a researcher in a lab, here's an applied researcher, more of a chronobiologist. Uh, here's people who've been accredited to do sleep coaching. Here's people who've been accredited to be a sleep physician. Because I get pe I get companies sent to me, we have a sleep physician. And I go, okay, who's your sleep physician? Blah, 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 blah. They're not even an occupational physician. They're a GP that you send people to if they have problems. Yeah, but they're a doctor. It's like, well, fuck, like what the fuck does that mean? Like, that's that, that means nothing. Like, it's just that we have this completely cowboy approach to managing problems with athletes and industry and the general population. And we struggle keeping abreast of this. Imagine if you're just the classic middle-aged man or woman out there going to work and you've got challenges with sleep. Where do you turn to trying to go through and decipher this? It's absolutely unbelievable. Anyway, I've ranted on too long. I've kept you guys too long. And that was part two. Um, we covered travel, jet lag, uh, mental health. I propose for the next episode, gentlemen, when we come back and we reconvene, we co cover the competitive competition factors, sleep disorders, and electronic device usage, which should wrap up a, a three-part series for us, if you guys are happy with that. 
I'm always happy. I'm Canadian. He really is always happy. I'm always grumpy. I'm American. I'm always depressed and irritable. <laughs> and then someone's going with, with some fucking stupid Irishman joke now next. So who's 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 going to jump in with some? <laughs> don't say I'm always drunk because I don't even drink. <laughs> Maybe You're I'm drunk off fighting. potatoes. Maybe I'm always yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we, we, we appreciate the platform. We love talking with you, Ian. Clearly, it's not just about the paper. It's about bigger issues as well. And so I think we can do a nice job wrapping it up in the third part. And um, yeah, thanks as always for having us on.